Um, how, how was your Christmas, Luke? Uh, yeah, it was. It was good. I mean, here's the thing, Michael. We're at the, the age where Christmas just it's just not that it's not as special as it once was. But you can still appreciate, you know, things like family, food, friends, and also um, <coughs> uh, what I was on TV. Yeah, exactly. Well, I mean, the thing is, Luke, I've got some, I've got some some good and some bad things in Christmas. Um, the the good thing is, I made just the most incredible turkey sandwich. Um, it was now I, I know you're a big fan of cheese. It was Cambazola, like on so obviously toasted, you know, brown bread because I'm a I'm a brown bread kind of guy. Um, just it's it's like Cambazola. It's like a cross between Stilton and Brie, and I just spread it all over it. Cranberry sauce on top. Next, white meat, white turkey meat. Uh, next. We got like pigs in blankets, but it was Torito sausage. It was just out of this world. Um, and then some stuffing on top. Then um, br- 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 like dark meat. And then we actually we had very thick gravy for confusing reasons, but very thick gravy. It was so thick that you could you know put it on on your sandwich, and it was like brown sauce. You know, it was just it was holding its shape. And then was it, it a little bit was of, it thick like Abby the uh, the otter? Yes, thick like Abby the otter. Do you know that um, reference or not? I I. Feel like I maybe should. What is it from? Uh, it's just from a, a tweet from um, uh, I can't remember. It was this aquarium. I'll get it up now because uh, it's it's quite a funny, funny tweet. I think I, I think I can probably get it up because uh, here it is. It's from the Monterey. Oh, oh yeah, no, yeah, I got you. Yeah, they apologise for calling me off a thick. Abby, this um, is the tweet. It's still up, by the way. Abby is a thick girl. One absolute unit. She chunk. Look at the size of this lady. Oh lord, she coming. Another internetism. And there you go. So, uh, wow. I mean, I don't really know what the problem was. Did people think it was racist? Uh, hi, hey, everyone. It's come to our attention that some of the references in this video are problematic and insensitive. We're posting here in the thread so that people who have engaged with this tweet will join us in our learning moment. Wow. That's beautiful. Um, so, but the important thing is, Luke, um, then I put some like red cabbage on top and that was the sandwich. Um, but here's the bad thing. Uh, my dad has this weird rule where he says like you shouldn't watch TV on Christmas. Um, what? Because you know, it's it, he's like, oh yeah, it's supposed to be family time. But okay. like, I'm like, yeah, I'm like, I, well, you know, I mean, everyone knows that the, the benefit of the TV is that you can spend time with somebody without having to actually, you know, talk to them. Yeah, um, it's great. So yeah, I know, and it was very disappointing to me because I was like, oh well, if we watch Nightmare Before Christmas, I could kill two birds with one stone here. <laughs> Hang out with all these geriatrics. Um, Hello and welcome to Selection Reflect, the movie review podcast where we look at films that have come out relatively recently at the cinema and see if they still hold up upon further inspection. I am your host, Michael, and I'm joined as always by my co-host, Luke. And this week, we are looking at Walt Disney's Henry Selleck's Tim Burton's The Nightmare Before Christmas. Mm-hmm. Um, Luke, why don't you tell us a thing or two about Walt Disney's Henry Selleck's Tim Burton's The Nightmare Before Christmas? Certainly, Michael. So, The Nightmare Before Christmas, marketed as Tim Burton's The Nightmare Before Christmas. Do you know why that was, by the way, if I was marketed like that? Uh, because people cared about Tim Burton, but nobody cared about Henry Selleck. Well, yes, people cared about Tim Burton, but why they didn't just call it The Nightmare Before Christmas? Uh, no, I don't. It's because, well, Disney were afraid that kids might not go to see it, so they wanted to attach Tim Burton's name to it, so it would get some fans of Tim Burton, or people who were like, oh yeah, I know Tim Burton, get uh, yeah, get them to come and see it. Uh, Batman fans. Yeah, exactly. So, like, yeah. For example, you wouldn't do that with, like, Jurassic Park, like Steven Spielberg's Jurassic Park, which also came out in 93. Like, it was just because they were afraid... Okay, no one here's my question, though. What was... Corpse Bride, because you know, do you remember Corpse Bride, Luke? I, I can't say. It was like, uh, really? Okay, okay. Here's an interesting thing, actually. So, uh, basically, Corpse Bride was like uh, an animated film 
which was about you can kind of imagine what it was about, it was about like zombies and like things like that but it was also a children's animated film and i was thinking to myself because i knew that was also possibly directed by tim burton and possibly not but i was thinking to myself like oh yeah that was intended for kids so i wonder if they called that tim burton's court bride corpse bride and they did so what we've established is whenever you make a uh, a film about scary stuff um but you want kids to watch it you need to call it tim burton's Corpse Bride. Do you think they did that for Hotel Transylvania? <laughs> well, Adam yeah. Sandler's Hotel Transylvania. No, I think they should have gone for Tim Burton's oh, Hotel Transylvania. Just make it up. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah the, um, the character just happens to be called Tim Burton. There was another one. I can't think what it was, but basically it was like a, a, a kid's show or like a kid's film. It was about zombies. Um, I'm going to try and remember what it was before this podcast is over, but it was like pretty good. Right. So maybe at the end of it, I can make a, a little maybe recommendation, even though it's not that great. Okay, well, I'll continue the introduction. Yeah, uh, so, The Night Before Christmas is a 1993 American stop motion animated musical dark fantasy Halloween Christmas film. I wonder how many of them exist. Yes. <laughs> uh, directed by Henry Selick and produced and conceived by Tim Burton. Uh, the screenplay is from Caroline Thompson and the story is by Michael McDowell. Um, stars Chris Sarandon, Catherine O'Hara, William Hickey, Glenn Shaddix, Paul Rubens, Ken Page, and Ed Ivory. Um, it was released on October the 29th, 1993. And Michael, the budget, how much did this cost um, to make? Well, see, animation seems quite expensive. Having said that, I feel like stop motion animation can't be that expensive. Basically, like, People on YouTube make stop motion animation. I mean, so, and YouTube isn't a billion dollar industry. So I'm going to go for, yeah, I don't know. Because, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm stuck between the animation feels. Also, it's quite short. I think the fact it was quite short made it less. So I'm actually going to go for 80 million. What did you say? 80 million? 80? Yeah. Oh, my God. Oh, well, you know, I feel like, I feel like inflation's messed me up on this one. That's going to be my guess, but how much is uh, it? Like? Well, it's going here's to be a the lot thing. Less. Like I th- when you said it, you thought I said eighteen. I thought you said eighteen, and that is correct. It's eighteen. So I was so, like, oh my god, he's fucking got it, bang on. But then wow. I was like, wait, he might have said eighty, which is wrong, and also incredibly wrong because of yeah, wow. So what you're saying is that that I was right for just a few seconds, is what you're not, saying. Not even a few for seconds those, for those few for those few seconds where you thought I said eighteen, yeah, like like a second at the microsecond. Yeah. Okay, right. so I mean, I'm happy with that. Okay. I'm counting that as a win. <laughs> and the, the box office. Well, I think, you know, that Tim Burton must have really got some butts in, in seats. People are like, oh, Tim Burton's. I loved Batman Returns, starring Danny DeVito as the Penguin. So, um, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to go see that. So I think, I mean, it, it's kind of like a cult classic now. You can never tell whether or not that translates to box office success at the time. I want to go for what feels like a modest 100 and, 60 million. Well, you got there in the end, Michael, uh, but it is not 160 million. It's actually only 76 million. Oh, dear. So, yeah, uh, uh, a lot less than the budget and a lot less than the box office. Remember, this is 25 years ago, and this is why we are doing this movie, because it's the 25th anniversary, and it's kind of a Christmas movie as well. It's a Halloween yeah, Christmas movie. It is kind of a Christmas movie, isn't yeah. it? So that's why we're doing it. So, yeah, you got to got to get your inflation. you got to put in perspective, you know, how, how much inflation has grown in those 25 years. Uh, yeah, but the thing is, actually, I was looking at um, a bit of information about the release of um, A Nightmare Before Christmas, and it was, I think, they released it in 3D in, like, 2007, which added an extra, like, 11 million. So it actually only made, originally, around 65 million when it was released. So there you go. Uh, wasn't wasn't as popular as you might think, considering, like you say, no, it, is a, uh, it is a bit of a classic and it's, yeah, that's why we're doing it, I guess. So I'll just explain the plot firstly. So it's quite a simple plot. I tell, uh, Jack Skeleton, the king of Halloween town, stumbles through a portal to Christmas town and decides to celebrate the holiday, uh, because he's sick of Halloween and he wants to, wants to experience Sick of Christmas. Halloween, sick of Halloween, sick of Halloween. And things don't go so well after that when he kidnaps Santa and delivers, uh, Halloween style presents. To all the children of this film. Like a town. poem of this film. Oh, is it? Well, just because it involves lots of things going wrong. Ah, I see. Is, is that the Coen Brothers? That's, that's all, yeah. 
things just things go going wrong. wrong. Yeah. If anything goes wrong, it's a it's a rip off of the ah, plan, right? They invented the idea of things going wrong. Okay, I get. It. So, Michael, how many nitpicks do you have for the night before Christmas? Um, one, I think. Let me just double check that. Oh, okay. I've got like two, but the second one's not very good. It would have been really good, but they ruined it by kind of fixing it later on, which I was very. Well, you can explain it about. anyway. It's fine. Yeah, I'll you. I will. Uh, I've got how many of you? I've got, got three, and I've also got a okay. nitpick. Oh, really? Okay. So my my first one is like. This is a recurring theme, but it really stuck out to me in the first bit. The amount of like half rhymes in this film is kind of insane. Like they've got one where it's like, um, if you want to find out how this begun, uh, no, no, it's like, well, if you want to find out where this is from, then the story's only just begun. Like that's kind of like the line. It's like right at the beginning, I'm thinking to myself, all right, okay. I mean, you're pushing it here. And like, uh, there's like a lot of them and I don't mind, but it was just like, well, it, it was like, like you the first mind. rhyming. Well, the first rhyming couplet in the whole thing, like that was the first, I think it might have been the second rhyming couplet, and it's already very much a half rhyme. I mean, from begun. Mm. Like, here's the thing, if you're like, if you're like a rapper, if you're MF Doom, if you're JPEG Mafia, and you want to do it for a half rhyme in there, I understand it, because you're making up with, it, with your flow. But this guy, this narrator, he's speaking in like spoken verse. And to be honest, I think his half rhymes were the worst. Okay. Well, that's your opinion, man. Yeah. Um, but the other one, which is not good, well, it was kind of good. Basically, he tells these three little kids, he's like, go kidnap Santa and don't involve Mr. Boogie Boogie in this. And they're like, we won't. They have their fingers crossed behind their backs. And then they're talking amongst it themselves. Uh, and Mr. Boogie Boogie, I think his name is Mr. Oogie Boogie. It's actually. Oogie Boogie, yeah. Yeah, Oogie Boogie. Mr. Oogie Boogie overhears them. And he's like, ooh, Santa, ha. But it's like, and I was thinking to myself, okay, what was the point in them crossing their fingers behind their backs if he's going to just overhear them? And of course, later on, they do actually ruin that nitpick a bit by having them take Santa to Mr. Oogie Boogie. But to be honest, at that point, it's so far removed from the initial incident that um, it was, I was still slightly upset by it. So, okay, I see. Yeah, you know, I would have thought like the logical way to do it would be like, you know, they've got their fingers crossed and then they immediately go and tell Mr. Oogie Boogie. Mm, fair enough. Do you like that song that goes, uh, Yes, sir, I can boogie. But I need a certain song. I can boogie, boogie boogie, all night long. Do you like that yeah, song? that's that's really good. Nice rendition. Uh, okay, yeah. so my net, uh, good. my nitpicks. Net pick. <laughs> <laughs> you fool. Uh, okay, so first nitpick. Where is Eid Mubarak, Michael? Where is Ramadan? Where is Hanukkah? Oh, Where is No Not November? Nice. Where is Passover? Where um, are all these church holidays? I think um, I think if you were a true American, you would understand that Eid Mubarak is uh, is not um, is not cherished. In fact, it's actually a very terror. It's a terrorist. Um, it's a terrorist holiday. Yeah. Yeah. Um, where's Where's Hanukkah? I mean, like that's the thing. I guess, like, yeah. Who Who determines what What is a holiday? Exactly. Um, mm. Yeah, and so it's why Americans they they say Happy Holidays all up until President Trump brought back Merry Christmas. Yeah. That is. Yeah. But yeah. So, because the, the amount of holidays just, I mean, I mean like, here's the thing, obviously, uh, Islam and uh, Judaism, they're not as popular in America as Christianity, but, like, come on. It, it, what, what, where's the threshold, Michael? Where's the core? Yeah, exactly. And I mean, the other question is, did, does, did the, uh, the Christmas land evolve with the changing perception of Christmas? Because, you know, back in, back in the, the BC time, was it like, um, was it just a pagan land? Was everyone like, ooh, I went to Christmas Land and they burned a virgin. Uh, I don't know, Michael. Uh, yeah, maybe it didn't evolve at the times, or maybe it yeah. was created whenever Christmas. The, the well, ideas I, of Christmas were created that we still. I, I feel like oh, that's the question because I mean, Christmas itself. I don't know when exactly, but it was created in a in a a Christian council. They got together and they said, "All right, when are we going to celebrate Jesus's birth?" Um, spoiler alert, Luke. Shocker. Massive twist. Jesus might not have actually been born on the 25th of December. Well, I know, because you know showed me that uh, documentary all about that. Oh, Zeitgeist? Yeah, the Zeitgeist, about how there's been many deities who have been born on the 25th yeah. of December. Well, you know what, Luke? Actually, I do need to retract that, because uh, upon further research, it does appear that that uh, offers a very simplistic and cherry-picked account. However, yes, it is worth noting that, of course, the reason why we have the 25th of December is because it was already a pagan holiday because of... Um, it being three know, days the after sun. the shortest day of the year. Yes. Um, and... That's great, isn't it? So, but the important thing is that uh, it was only really during the Victorian times when everyone worked everything out 
So uh, yeah. I don't know. Well, when did Charles Dickens write his his books? Yeah, what's it? What's uh, is it just no, that, Yeah, no, a Christmas Carol. That's it's called it's Christmas Carol. Yeah. Uh, that was in the um, Victorian times yeah, was too. Yeah, like in the eighteen sixties or something. Yeah. Yeah. The other thing actually is that uh, it used to be Santa was an elf, which is where um, the whole him coming down your chimney thing comes from, because he was like a Christmas elf. He'd come around for people presents. Um, while in the UK, Father Christmas was based on like an old uh, god of like festivity. So he was like really fat and jolly. And basically they got combined together into a really fat guy who goes down people's Christmas trees. Uh, sorry, down people's, Christmas, <laughs> down people's chimneys. Huh. Um, well, the more you learn. Well, the more you know, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, next next nitpick. Uh, so this guy, Finkelstein, um, he, get, he gets poisoned by Sally, and yet he still makes her cook for him. Like, yeah, it idiot. is very confusing. Um, I I feel like he is just very dumb. Um, well, he's a doctor, though. Well, you know what it is. I mean, like some doctors aren't that smart. Like uh, like Doctor Ben Carson. <laughs> Maybe he's the Doctor Ben Carson of, of this world. Oh God, fucking Ben Carson! I haven't thought about him in ages. Got literally the guy. What was his job in the cabinet? Isn't like uh, a head of housing. And yeah, yeah, I think it is. Yeah, it's head of head of housing, maybe head of urban development. Yeah, and something similar. Trump literally gave him the job because he he was black. Yeah, that's that's that's, that's the reason. Well, black black people do live in houses. They do. Yeah. Um. Well, you you know why? It's because obviously, uh, the secretary of housing or whatever. Naturally, like in in a lot of black people live in what they call the projects, I guess, uh, mm. in America. So that that's what Trump was thinking. I believe that is actually the case, and I'm not even joking. I think that is really what happened. Well, you know what? Good, good for him. <laughs> yeah, getting. Uh, he should have really got somebody from the projects to be the secretary of housing. I think that would work well. Yeah, I guess so. Um, um, lock, shock, and barrel. This is my next nip, by the way. Lock, shock, and barrel. The mischievous trick of treating children. Um, they take thirty-five days to abduct Santa Claus, Michael. So think about yeah, it. hold on. and don't they take relatively less time to abduct um, the Easter Bunny? The Easter Bunny. Yeah, so they're literally like, which is weird because you'd think that the Easter Bunny would be much harder to catch <laughs> than some fat old man. Yeah. So they well, here's the thing. They Jack Skeleton tells them you gotta kidnap Santa. So they even he explains as well what Santa looks like. They don't even get a man. They get like a bunny. So I don't know how you confuse those two. Like how you could possibly think a giant rabbit is same, the same guy that Jack Skeleton described, or whatever. Um, and then like it's literally the next day they get the rabbit and obviously they then they bring him back, but then like they capture Santa Claus the night before Christmas, or one day before yeah, Christmas. Yeah, and when all through the house, not a creature is stirring, not even a mouse. Mm-hmm. And that's thirty-five days later. So what were they doing for those thirty-five days? Um, I don't know. Probably, uh, probably being Tom Cruise. You know, I hate to use that kind of language, but <laughs> okay. And uh, I've got a lip hit, Michael, as well. Uh, yes. There is actually a Nightmare Before Christmas video game. Oh, wow. Yeah, it's called. You know what? That's, that sounds fun. Yeah, it's called The Nightmare Before Christmas Oogie's Revenge. If I can just find it here. Where Where is it? I can't find it. I'll just I'll just control that. Sorry, this is very unprofessional. Okay. By the way, you are definitely recording, right, Luke? Because I just realised I'm not recording a backup. No, I maybe I, I, I am recording. Don't worry. Yeah. I mean, it seems like I feel like it's going to be one of those things where we've done it once, so we'll never do it again now. Well, hopefully. So here we go. The 2004 video game, The Nightmare Before Christmas: Oogie's Revenge, did serve as a sequel of the film. Uh, yeah. Basically, it was released on PlayStation 2. Um, and yeah, it just goes it goes to my theory that in the early 2000s, like there was literally a video game for absolutely everything. Like, can you imagine if they released a video game now for an obscure, well, I guess it's not really obscure, but like a, a, a Christmas uh, movie that uh, existed or that was released 10 years ago, like in 2008? I, I would play Jim Carrey's The Grinch. Yeah, exactly. Um, well, what I like is there's, there's an old Flash game, which is Santa Claus's um, sled breaks down, and uh, the only way he has to get onto people's um, roofs is with a jetpack that runs off farts. So basically, what you have to do is, is little kids who don't like their Brussels sprouts are surreptitiously scraping their Brussels sprouts out of the window. And you, Santa Claus, have to go and eat the Brussels sprouts um, before they go, before they disintegrate into the snow. Um, and then by eating the Brussels sprouts, you get fart power 
And with that fart power, you can fart your way onto the chimneys, thus delivering gifts to people. That, that kind of reminds me of uh, another Flash game called Run Ronaldo Run, which was uh, it was based on the, the fat Ronaldo. What you had to do was like <laughs> eat burgers and, and drink like uh, sodas. On all of that, so you you have the energy to uh, kick footballs into into uh, into the net. So yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's, that's fat Ronaldo. Yeah. You know you know what I mean? the Brazilian Ronaldo. Oh oh that Ronaldo. Yeah yeah okay. But yeah. <laughs> not that, the, other, the other Ronaldo. Yeah, I was gonna say he's not he's not very fat, is he? Like, no, old not. Christy. Uh, so yeah, there you go. That is that is my lip pick. It was actually yeah. a video game made out. of Incredible. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, that is cool. Um, speaking of video games, at the end of uh, the Jurassic Park video game, if you collect all of the collectibles, then um, Ian Malcolm or Jeff Goldblum appears and tells you to get a life and stop playing video games. Is that actually true? It's, it's true. He does. He, he appears like, hey, uh, it's a uh, Jeff Goldblum here, and uh, I'm just saying, uh, what, what are you doing uh, with your life? Just uh, go outside. Uh, Create some memories. Uh, stop wasting your life on uh, video games. Uh, like that. That's great. He says lots of us. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, that's, uh, that's, that is great. When did that game come, uh, come out? Uh, it came out, I think it came out like in, in the early 90s. Um, so I think it was like, a, I don't know, probably you played it on your Atari. That's the thing, isn't it, Luke? Yeah. Atari. Uh, anyway, you know what, Luke? I, realize, I didn't ask you a, a question. You didn't ask me a I question know, either. Yeah. Uh, did did you like this film? Did I like this film? Uh, I, yeah, you know what I did. I was like, it was it was nice. That's the word. I just yeah, said. it was nice. What about you? Did you like it? I I also uh, like this film. I guess um, I think in some ways I felt like this film. It wasn't. I I, I didn't love it. I did like it. Mm, yeah. Um, so we'll we'll talk about the the plot, shan't we, Luke? Yes, we shall. That's what we do. Um. So, uh, basically, <laughs> this guy called, well, it ends with Halloween just being over, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, well, no, and... you mean it starts with Halloween being over. Yeah, sorry, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It starts with Halloween. I, I was thinking of Halloween having ended, so I already had the word end in my oh, head. Okay. It starts with Halloween having just begun, mm-hmm. doesn't it? Mm-hmm. No, 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 it starts with Halloween just ending. Ah! Um, <laughs> and basically, I guess... So Jack Skellington, yeah, Skellington, who is also called the Pumpkin King, mm. which is a bit confusing because you'd think if he was called the Pumpkin King, his head would be a pumpkin. Yeah, I don't um, know. Maybe it's just, he should it's be just called a the title. Skull King. There's, yeah, that's there's true. There's been a lot I mean, of like pumpkin kings in in this town's past, and it's just you know he's the next one. Well, are are people immortal in this world? Because I kind of just felt like they seem pretty immortal. Um, yeah, possibly. So anyway, and he kind of decides that. Um, in many ways, it's it's your classic Disney formula. Uh, the the king or princess or prince person in position of power decides that they don't like being in a position of power because of their fundamental objections to the institutions of the society in which they live. Uh, that's a classic story, isn't it? Like, it, it is a classic like, story. Um, I can't actually think of any examples, but I feel well, like frozen. we both know. Frozen. There we go. So Jack Skellington is frozen, and he's going, let it go. And then he does Christmas. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And he kind of just like, I mean, to be honest, it says a lot that people clearly aren't very, uh, like, it, it, what's the word, like, ambitious in a way, in like this well, way, because basically what we have to do. Was Disney Frozen? Or was Frozen Disney? Or was it Pixar? It was, it was, uh, it was, it was Disney, I remember. It was Disney, because right. it was kind of like confusing. Disney really messed everything up by going into 3D animation. They really did. Um, well, thankfully, they didn't want to imagine that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but weirdly, and the confusing thing is Brave. Is um is Pixar so Tangled and uh, Frozen are both Disney, but Brave is Pixar. That's another example of your your uh, theory, Brave. Yeah, you're yeah. right. That is actually probably the best example of my theory. So anyway, um yeah, but basically you don't really need to walk that far. Uh, if you go on a full lawn stroll, then very quickly you will end up in in the multiverse, the the Spider Verse, um, and you'll be able to go to all of these different worlds. So he goes to Christmas Land, and he really likes it. Um, and <laughs> I'm just describing what happens. Yeah, you but, you know, I was waiting for you to make a point about it, but no, you just did, yeah. I don't know. Like in, in my head, it's kind of just like I guess one of the problems with this film is that there's not like that much to it, so it's kind of like hard to make a point about it. I'm just thinking to myself, like, yeah, everything happened. Nothing that happened was bad, 
Uh, well, yeah, I guess the only in yeah, the formula. only problem is it was a bit yeah, it was a bit simple. Uh, do you have anything actu- actually point- pointy to say? Yeah, I, well, from my point of view, uh, I think Jack Jack Skeleton is probably going through like a midlife crisis. It has all. Oh, so elements. you're saying he's a lot like um, he's a lot like Kevin Spacey from American uh, Beauty. <laughs> yeah. Oh God, like I, it's my favorite movie, American Beauty and House of Cards. It just doesn't work. House of Cards is my favorite. TV show, or the first two seasons were, because the first two seasons were really good, then it dropped off. And he's in both of them, and I really liked him. <laughs> he's just ruined, like I said to you, he's just ruined yeah. everything. I I really liked him as an actor, um, yeah, same. to be honest. Like, I think to myself, like, oh, Kevin Spacey's in this, that's neat. Um, and now I just think, oh, no. Um, but anyway, more importantly, yeah, so basically, well. yeah, so Jack Skellington is... Um, yeah, he's going through a midlife he's, crisis, Michael. He wants to bang his daughter's um, friend at school. Yeah. yeah, he's going through a midlife crisis. Basically, he's like, oh, I don't, it's, my life is so monotonous. Every year I do Halloween and, you know, I don't really have anything to complain about. Life's good, but I just, I just want more, you know. He, he wants to be where the people are. He wants, he wants to be where the people are. I exactly. want to be where the people are. And so what does he do? He, he has his midlife crisis. He becomes Santa Claus, flinging stuff. Clinging presents to uh to children, and then he gets shot down, and he realizes, oh shit, I I'm Jack Skeleton, the Pumpkin King. I uh, I can't I can't be doing this. Then his midlife crisis finishes, and he goes back to what he does best. Yeah, I mean, what would you say is this film's essential thesis? Would you say it's that you should uh not immigrate, and every single person should live in their own little ethno states? Yeah, it should be just be happy with what you have, basically, Michael. How about that? Yeah, exactly. Be happy, happy uh, with what you have. Uh, no, yeah, but the thing is, like, yeah, especially if you're a king of a, an entire holiday themed <laughs> universe, I think you should be happy with what you yeah. have. You can sympathise with him, obviously, because um, it must be, it must be boring doing Halloween or living in a Halloween world or just the same world in general, uh, a similar themed world for 365 days and 366 on a leap year. Uh, yes, but you know, he's he. he He's the pumpkin king, and at the end of the day, he does realize that he's like, you know what, I'm I'm the, I'm the scariest motherfucker around. That's what I should concentrate on. Yeah, yeah. it's like in Wreck It Ralph, where he realizes that there's nothing wrong with being a villain, and he's just going to own it. Is that what happens in Wreck It Ralph? Uh, kind of, but not exactly. Um, it's more like I guess the thing is, really, in Wreck It Ralph, they redefine the very concept of being a villain. So as to make him look like less of an evil person. Why didn't we um, review that? That sounds quite interesting. Yeah, to be honest, I don't know. I think it's because we didn't care about Ralph Breaks the Internet. Um, it's actually like, I think I, I I have seen it. I actually did quite enjoy it. So I don't know. Maybe when they do a Ralph does something else, then we'll watch it. Or maybe we'll just have one of those random days where, you know, there's nothing out. And then we can decide to review it, even though we'll probably have something else more worth reviewing. Anyway. I guess the only thing that I I really have to say about the plot is that there was a a kind of uh, I wanted to use a really fancy word uh, oh conspicuous that's it Ooh. there was a, a, something of a, a conspicuous absence of uh, antagonists yeah I thought and, that as well because the thing is basically this this is your stuff um, Jack Skellington is the main driver of the bad thing in this in this film. Uh, even though he's actually completely well intentioned, basically he just does everything wrong because he's stupid. Um, like I mean, he's not really stupid, but like I mean, he's kind of stupid. Basically, it's all a mistake. Nobody was planning on destroying Christmas. He just did it, you know, without without meaning yeah. to. Yeah. So but there's this thing then, like, sorry, just to oh, yeah. cut in. It's he's fine. like he really cares about Christmas and making kids happy and all that, but. He he sees the gifts that all the town are making for these kids, and yeah, he recognizes they're not nice. So what does he think is going to happen? Like, I don't get it. Yes, uh, there's like a bit where he's like, um, like micromanaging all the gifts people are making, mm-hmm. and you're thinking, hey, buddy, you might want to realize that these aren't really good gifts for people to be yeah. giving people. But you know, whatever. I mean, it's like yeah, he's like do something. What what should have happened really is um. There should have been an antagonist, somebody who doesn't like Jack Skeleton. Yes. And is like, oh, he, he's envious of Jack Skeleton. It's like, oh, I want to be the pumpkin king. I'm the scariest person here. And then I, I, Jack Skeleton gets this idea to do Christmas, and this guy's like, 
what the fuck is this guy doing? You know, it's like, oh, I, I know how to, how to usurp him. I'll, I'll sabotage his Christmas thing. So all the townspeople make good presents, but he then, like, puts, he, he can do a nice song and dance and put a curse on all the presents. I don't know. Or something like yeah. that. And then, then the presents Jack Skeleton's handing out are, you know, the, the ones he actually hands out in the movie just, you know, that it wasn't, they weren't meant to be like that. They were meant to be nice presents. And so then yeah. he sabotaged. And then at the end, he's like, what happened? And obviously the bad guy loses somehow. And Jack Skeleton's like, you know what? I am good. I'm still good with being the fucking king. Yeah. Yes. Everyone loves I, I have a. Uh... I have four points to make. I think, first of all, I think Jack Skeleton should have done a really good Christmas, but then what should have happened is somebody should have stolen Christmas because when they were a kid, uh, they had a beard and they tried to shave it all oh, off for fuck's sake. and everyone laughed at them. Um, <laughs> okay, so I did actually, I, I had three serious points though, as well as that uh-huh. one. So first of all, you do have Mr. Oogie Boogie. Uh, and yes, sir, he can boogie. He's not really an antagonist boogie, boogie. though, is he? Yeah, that's the thing. Like he's He's kind of just like, like he's he's the person who is defeated at the end, even though he doesn't really matter. Like Jack's ultimate victory is defeating Mister Oogie Boogie, even though Mister Oogie Boogie doesn't matter. Yeah. So that's a that's guy a, that wants well, to gamble kind of, and eat people. Yeah, and I think that's kind of a problem because you know he doesn't, and it kind of goes back to my nitpick about how like it all seems very just illogical the way that the oogie boogie guys introduce like he's just like over here oh santa and then he doesn't do anything for an hour Mm. which is quite impressive in a film that's only an hour and 15 minutes anyway uh and then the other thing is so you know when uh jack skellington gets shot out of the sky and are here no uh, the mayor i guess he's a mayor it's a bit confusing what exactly his job is i think it's literally the mayor on his shirt well, you know what? I mean, I'm just a bit confused because I'm thinking, like, I would think that a mayor is the most important person in Halloween Town. Nah, so it's a bit the, confusing the that there's a position above him. Yeah. Um, so you really do, do city states have mayors? Because that seems kind of redundant. More importantly, though, <laughs> uh, like, who's the mayor of Vatican City? Who's the mayor of San Marino? I mean, it's, that's a good question, Michael. But yeah, basically, he goes around and he's like calling on this, on this thing. He's like, Jack. Skellington's been blown to smithereens, blah, blah, blah. And I was thinking to myself, like, you would think that at this point it would be like he would try and usurp power or like it would be revealed that he was trying to take control of Halloween Land. Like I was imagining, like, for example, you know, he's crying. He's going, oh, no, Jack Skellington's dead. He's so sad. And then he starts laughing because he's like, ha ha. Um, or like, because here's the thing. Okay, I had a very kind of limited memory of this film. Like I remember the rough idea, but not all of it. And and the bit where... um. He says, like, oh, Jack Skellington's de- dead, and he starts, like, um, crying. He gets in his car, and he drives through a gate, and then it starts panning off into the direction of the gate. And I was expecting it to pan to Jack Skellington's house, and it was kind of going to be a bit of a funny moment where he's, like, crying, and he's like, oh, no, Jack Skellington's dead, and then he drives off in tears and drives into Jack Skellington's house to reside there, thus representing his position as, as a usurper. Uh, but none of that happened. <laughs> um, he just... so. I was thinking like that would make sense if it was like he he was and especially seeing as the other thing is he has the thing with his his head yeah where he's got a face on one side and a face on the other side and immediately I was thinking to myself when I saw his design I was like oh that that indicates that he's duplicitous he's two faced and one of his faces is you know really kind of scary looking and the other face is kind of nicer looking so obviously he's gonna be a, a secret villain um, and again he is that would have been a um, nice twist actually if the mayor was the yeah. villain yeah he doesn't really do anything. Um, and then, so I was kind of thinking like that would make sense. And then I guess you could have Mr. Oogie Boogie as his henchman. And then the other thing I was thinking, just because I thought this would be cool, uh, is if like uh, Jack Skellington told them about it. And then I feel like this is from something, but I can't think what it's from. Uh, like this idea, but Jack Skellington told them about it. And then all of the Halloween people were like, oh, we're going to go attack them. And he had a little Halloween versus Christmas war. I think that would be neat. Just a massive Lord of the Rings style battle. I don't think it'd be much of a war, to be honest, Michael. Yeah. It'd be like, I, I think I'd, I'd love it. <laughs> Just have like the elves get massacred. That werewolf could um, do some serious damage. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, I don't know. Like, obviously, there wouldn't actually be a battle. But maybe it was like they were preparing for war. And they're like, oh, we're going to do this whole war thing. Um, and then Jack Skellington realizes, oh, wait, no, I'm going to save the day. Um, and all of those things, I think, would have given the film some kind of... It's not really like a matter of narrative thrust. I use that term in Fantastic Beast where it didn't have a narrative thrust, but in this it's more like an, an anti-narrative thrust because, of course, your narrative thrust is what 
Jack Skellington wants to do. Mm -hmm. And that's completely clear. There's no doubt about what Jack Skellington wants to do, and that's all perfectly well established. The problem is there's no real conflict because there's no clear force well, there's no antagonist. Opposing. Yeah, there's no anti yeah. Apart, yeah, the the only thing that's opposing it is the idiocy of Jack Skellington and the incompetence of the general Halloween community to organise a Christmas thing. General Halloween and, community. Yeah. yeah. Um, and that's it. No, yeah, so you're completely right. Basically. Yeah. There's no anti Jack Skeleton. Other, yeah. There's nothing to stop him or to stop his plans. Like you know, there's no conflict. And the only thing to, that stops him, like you say, is just him being uh, an idiot. So, yeah, I agree. Yes. So, basically, uh, two, two out of ten. No, thanks for watching the review. Um, yeah, the thing is, no, yeah, they, I, they, I mean, I don't know how long it took them to make this movie, but it's only an hour and 15, and they could have easily added another 15 minutes on that included stuff with the uh, with the villain, uh, of this um, uh, hypothetical villain. And, yeah, it would have made the movie better, and you would have definitely obviously, obviously had the time for uh, for that villain, so yeah, uh, Tim yeah, Burton's uh, a fucking idiot. I can say. Yeah, we hate him. So, uh, but anyway, I think that's really all we have to say about the plot. Obviously, this is a very short film, so the plot pretty pretty simple. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. But I tell you what's slightly, some might say, interesting about this film. Oh, I thought you were going to say what's slightly uh, less simple. That would have been. A good you know, I was thinking point. about it, then I just thought I wasn't going to. Okay, so yeah, I will tell you what's slightly less simple, Luke. The uh, animation of this film. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, of course, we all know stop motion animation. It's the favorite way to have your Lego characters fight each other and then film it and put it on YouTube. Or your favorite way to have your uh, Lego uh, football players score a goal or recreate World Cup final goals using Lego objects. Yeah, Lego is just so great because it's just so easy to film with. Yeah, it's um, great. So is your favorite way to make Ray Harryhausen style monsters for your 1950s fantasy adventure film? Yes, and it's also a way to make a film that's called Nightmare Before yes. Christmas. So, what do you want to say about the animation? Well, like, you were more gun ho about talking about it, so I'll let you. Well, it's because Michael, I was looking through the Wikipedia page on this, and it's quite impressive the animation of this movie. The thing is, we've seen I've, I've grown up with stop motion animation because I've seen like Wallace and Gromit. Wallace and Gromit. Yeah. I knew you were going to say Wallace, Wallace and, Gromit. and Gromit. There you go. Uh, yeah, I've seen uh, stop motion animation like that, and there's also like there's a there was a kid show when I was young. It was called like Shaun the Sheep, and that was it's Shaun the Sheep. Yeah, du, 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 it's Shaun the Sheep. Du, 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 du. He even larks around with those who cannot. Is that the actual? Um, yes. Yeah. yeah, I uh, I didn't really watch it, I but I knew. What's, what's, what's the end like? It's like there's a one man did to put Shaun the Sheep. I can't remember. I'd have to look it up. But yeah, so I, I've grown up with stop motion animation, as have you, Michael, with Wallace and Gromit and Sean the Sheep and all that. But at the time, from what I looked at on the Wikipedia page, uh, this this was quite revolutionary. Um, for example, Roger Ebert believed the film's visual effects were as revolutionary as Star Wars, uh, taking into account those um, uh, visual effects. He said that night, the Nightmare Before Christmas was filled with imagination that carries us into a new world. So there you go. That's, that's Roger Ebert, Michael, giving high praise to the uh, stop motion animation. And it was also nominated for this film for both the Academy Awards for Best Visual Effects. Oh, sorry. I, for a moment when you said like both, I thought you were going to say like, both the Academy Awards for Best Visual Effects and, and I was like... Um, I don't know. Is there two oh. Academy Awards for Best Visual Effects? I'm just literally reading what was on Wikipedia. So uh, yeah, I don't really know. I mean, oh sorry, yes, no. The film was nominated for both the Academy <laughs> Award for Best Visual Effects and the Hugo Award for Best Dramatic Presentation. Sense. Yes, you are right. That makes more sense. I, sh- I should really oh, yeah. listen to. So we've established yet. You, you are a fool. I know. I, I am an idiot. Um, but yeah, so there you go. Leave. It was incredibly well received. The stop motion animation, and I've got some interesting statistics here, Michael. Um, do you want to have to take a guess? Uh, how many frames were taken for this film, or how many frames there are in this movie? Um, okay, well, so we know, of course, that a lot of films are 24 frames per second. This film is an hour and 15 minutes long, 60 seconds, so 60. I'm going to guess uh, 10, 20, 30, 40, I'm going to guess three. I'm going to guess 64,000. Why 64,000? Because I, I was considering doing it mathematically, and I realized that I couldn't because I'm too dumb. Well, we have a calculator so, here, actually. So, so 24. 
Yeah, okay, yeah. 24 frames per second times by... Oh, wait. Times. No. Let me... Let me... <laughs> so, so, so first of all, we have to work out how many seconds. So there were 115 minutes in the film, roughly, mm-hmm. give or take. So we divide that, no, times it by 60, mm-hmm. and that gives us the number of seconds. Because, oh, you're going to love this, Luke. 69,000. Whoa. Uh, times 24 mm-hmm. equals 165,600. Okay. Well, it, it was actually less. So there you go. That makes sense. Because the thing is, that would be every... So I'm assuming that they had, um, you know, yeah. like... Not 24 frames per frames. second. How many frames yeah. do you think they had in total then? So I'm going to assume... Frames per second. What was it? So I'm, I'm going to assume that... that, that one quarter of their frames were unique frames. Thus, we divide it by four. I think forty-one thousand four hundred frames in this in this in this movie. Forty-one thousand. Yeah. The in total there were one hundred nine thousand four hundred forty frames taken for this film. One hundred nine thousand. That's a lot. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's a yeah. I just I I the reason why I wanted you to do the uh, multi- multiplication was because I thought if we provided context for that number. Yeah, that's a lot yeah. then. So that means almost every single well, not there. Yeah. That means okay, I'm gonna find out the maths here. So one six five six hundred. Oh that's nice to do. One This is great. Six five six hundred. Well you know, these these are the important maths. People love maths. So one six five six hundred. And how many of those frames were there in this film? There were one hundred and nine thousand four hundred and forty frames. Which means Luke that <laughs> <laughs> You know what? I just realized I, I did it the wrong way around. So I got that, and then like that, and then like that, and then like that. Okay, I can tell you, Luke, that in fact, 66.1% of the frames in this film were completely original frames. Not, not repeated frames, but rather handcrafted by animators to get the exact feelings and sensations of movement. Pretty impressive, Michael. Yeah, see, here's my question, though. How much can you advance just moving a little bit of Play-Doh? I don't don't know. Yeah, I did like... Okay, here's the one thing I was kind of thinking to myself. I really liked the backdrops because I was looking at the sky and I was thinking it's kind of weird because it looks, like, eerily artificial and yet at the same time, like, it it works. And I was thinking it's kind of weird that it's probably just, like, you know, a tiny model Mm -hmm. and the sky is just, like, some guy's, you know cardboard it's like hey let's paint this piece of cardboard black yeah shows uh, how good we go. practical effects can be michael yeah it's cool because you know things don't have to look realistic um so it's all about the story isn't it Luke? it's all about the story you know um another statistic for you michael how many uh heads do you think jack skeleton had uh i'm gonna guess he had at least two no he had more so basically um the amount of heads um there were a lot of heads necessary because of the uh they wanted to get every expression of every possible emotion from Jack Skeleton. So yeah. how many heads did he did he have, Mike? I'll have a guess. Well okay, Another well one. how many how many emotions are there? I think there are about I think there are about twenty two emotions. So I think he had twenty two. Um again, you're you're slightly off. Um Jack Skeleton twenty four. <laughs> twenty nine. He uh, had around four hundred heads. Oh wow. Yeah. That's a lot. That is a lot of That's heads. a lot of emotion. That's more emotions than, than we have between us. Yeah. Because we're very monotonous. Think, think about how many... Uh, oh, well, think about, obviously, this film is a cult classic. You know, it's... that You could sell those 400 heads, like, genuine yeah, heads. Actually, you know what? Now I think about it, I guess, because I, I made a bit of a ironic joke about moving Play-Doh around. But, of course, this character was, in fact, not made out of Play-Doh. Um, and I suppose, like... So with Wallace and Gromit and Sean the Sheep, it's like Play-Doh or clay. Uh-huh. In fact, it's officially called claymation. Um, and therefore, you can kind of make uh, micro gestures. I think that's what they're called. Um, quite easily, uh-huh. you know, you can move the face around. But I suppose with this, I guess Jack's face was made out of like wood. Yeah, probably. Or something. So probably they actually had to. So every single little gesture, they had to actually get a new new face. So yeah, screw screw wow. a new head there. So just just the amount of time. I mean, you said Michael. That this movie wasn't that expensive to make. However, yeah. maybe it was expensive to make because obviously time. time is money. Yeah, time is money. Think about it. These these people could have spent time with their kids. They could have spent time and they didn't. Doing what arseholes. Yeah, doing something else with their lives. Yeah, could have spent time, you know, during cancer. Mm. Instead they 
spent hundreds of hours moving little bits of Play-Doh around to create a, yeah. a movie. I hate this film. <laughs> but for children. Yeah. So, yeah, that's the animation. Um, like I said, incredibly impressive. And I hope after those stats and the accolades that I told you it received, you, you would agree with me. Yes. Yes. Um, I rate 8 out of 8. There we go. Uh, so I just, I'm just having a look. They started production in July 1991. So this movie uh, came out in October 1993. So, yeah, quite a long time then it must have taken them to... Uh, to do all this. Yeah. Yeah. A, a bloody flipping long bloody time. Bloody flipping long time. Yes. So now, Michael, I think we should move on to something else. Songs or characters? What do you want to do? Uh, I think we should do songs. Um, mostly because there was a lot of music in this. Considering how short it was, it was kind of just like a song, conversation, song, conversation. Like um, Mamma Mia. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. It was just like Mamma Mia. Uh, I like the bit where, where they started singing the Money, Money, Money song out of nowhere. Um, <laughs> money, money, now, money. Here's the question, Luke. Can we remember every single song? So, the only songs I remember, I remember This Is Halloween, everyone knows that. Yeah, that's the most famous one. I still have it in my head two hours after after watching, yeah. the, watching um, it. And I don't I don't really remember Jack Skellington's I'm Very Sad song. It was like, I'm sad because I wish that I wasn't doing Well, I've doing got all things. the songs written down here, Michael. Okay, that's good. Are they in chronological order? They are. Better be. Yeah, don't worry. So, we got This Is Halloween. Which is the first this one. This is Halloween. This is Halloween. Yeah. Right to the point. No messing about. You know, it's a, it's yeah. incredible. It's kind of just like an intro song. Yeah. So it's, it's got such a good beat and it just fits so well. It's like a, like Greece, where the first song is literally the, the most famous song or the best song, I guess. Do, 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 do. Yeah, the summer loving song. Yeah. Da, na, 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 na. And this one. Is, tell me more. Tell me more. Da, 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 da. Right into it. This is bloody Halloween, it is. Uh, so next we got Jack's Lament, that sad song. Yeah, so that's that's the sad song, which, to be honest, didn't leave much of an no. impression. Yeah, yeah, it's okay. Sorry, sorry, Jackie. And then we got this next song, which I enjoyed, which is the What's This song. Yes, so that's that, that one's always quite good. Yeah. Yeah, it's fast-paced, and uh, yeah, I enjoyed it. What's this? What's this? Yeah, very good. Uh, next we got the uh, Town Meeting song. And I like in that song where Jack's like, oh shit, like he realises I've got to make this Santa Claus guy sound scary uh, to get people to buy into this Christmas idea. Like, that's the thing, he yeah. shows, he's a smart guy there, which just makes him not realising that the presents he's giving to the kids are going to make them very sad, even more baffling. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, moron. nothing to say about the town meeting song, Michael? Uh, no, I don't even remember it. What do you mean you don't does remember it? Go, it? Uh, does it go... Um, Yo, my name is Jack. I've got someone to tell you about this town meeting. Yeah, let's go. Yeah, well, I can't actually remember the beat, or I can remember the actual. I, I remember. I, yeah, well, I remember the concept. Yeah, the concept. Song. Yeah, okay, that's fine. That's that's what I thought you meant when you said you didn't remember. I remember it being like, but yeah, I don't really remember. Um, it, again, it didn't leave much of an impression. Yeah. I'm afraid. Luke. I'm sorry. You know, soon <laughs> we got Jack's obsession next, which sounds like a fragrance. Um, uh, yeah, is that when he's talking about? What's that? I don't know. That's remember. when he's in his house and he's like, oh, Christmas. How, how can I make these people get Christmas? And he's like, I know. We'll just steal Christmas. That's, you know, he has that eureka moment, like how Halloween time will take over Christmas this year. Oh, I see. Yeah. Um, do you remember? Got you. Yes, yeah. I do. All right. So, yeah, again, that's not very really remember- <laughs> uh, rememberable, as you've just shown. Uh, then we got Kidnap the Sandy Claws for the kids. Again, I like, kind of like that one. That's fast-paced. That's we fun. can do anything by working with each other. Yeah, I think you guys can kidnap Santa Claus. Then we got Making Christmas, which is um, just them singing about. So here it is, Making Christmas. Everybody's having fun. Look to the future now. It's only just begun from. Hey, you just rhymed begun and from. Yeah. Was that a callback? Yeah, that was a callback. Wow, I like that. Well done. Yeah. Uh, Good memory. We got Oogie Boogie's song next. Oh, yeah. Yes, sir. I can boogie. Oogie Boogie. Yeah, that's how it goes. Uh, he's, he's got swag, Oogie Boogie, which I yeah. appreciate. Um, in fact, I'll, actually, should I say this now or later about Oogie Boogie's character? Uh, I'll say it later. All right, we'll say it later. We'll save it. Then we got Sally's song. She's just very um, sad. 
Well, you know, we yeah, have. I think this is the first time. There's a lot of sad songs in this. Yeah, this is the first time we've mentioned parts of Tim Burton maybe. I mean, what do you, what do you expect, Matt? Um, yeah. Th- this, is, we, this is the first time I think we've actually mentioned Sally. Yeah, well, you know what? I was kind of going to talk. Uh, there is a love story element to yes, this. Yes, exactly. We didn't talk about uh, that, in the which plot. I was kind of kind of talk about with the characters, I guess, seeing as we didn't mention. Well, it, it seems like um, it's not obviously the most important part, but it's fairly important. I mean, we see a lot of shots yeah. of Sally um, in the movie, so yeah, it's weird that we haven't mentioned her up to this point. Yeah, but that's just maybe we're misogynists. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, I mean, <sighs> well, well, we we can't talk about it now, Luke. That would just make no mm. sense. Yeah. Well, we kind of could because well, he's talking about how much he loves him, but never yeah. mind. There's just two two more songs to go, which is Poor Jack, which is when he realizes, like, he, he, when it comes to the end of his midlife crisis. He starts crisis, pouring, some, pouring some Jack Daniels. Yeah, exactly. Uh, as he stops that. And then you got the finale slash reprise, which is the final song. Uh, yeah. So overall, how many songs are there? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. And I think there's only three good ones. So there you go. But there's no, there's no, like, bad ones. There's no, like, a, what was the one from Greece that really pissed me off? Um, oh, goodness They me. did an SNL parody of it recently, actually, with Steve Carell. It was like, oh, what was it? Fucking Beauty School Dropout, that's what it was. Oh, Beauty School Dropout. Go back to high school. See, I remember, I remember that one. It's beautiful, oh, isn't it? Oh, God, it's so, so bad. Oh, I, I Actually, there was, you know, I saw a conversation on Twitter today about Greece just someone I follow and it's like apparently people genuinely like Greece and I don't get it I mean yeah it's, it's, it's like has anyone actually watched the, like the movie yeah I don't know I mean it's just it's we, I was talking about that I don't know what it was we were watching a film uh, I was watching a film with my dad and I was like it was a film where I was thinking like oh you know it's a film where um, where everyone says they love it it's got all this hype around it but you actually watch it and it's not very good and I was like it's like Greece um, and and yeah, so basically that's that's my new analogy. Greece is like my go-to example of a film where there's loads of hype around it, but when you watch it, Luke... Yeah, it's just shit. It, this, this ain't it, Chief. <laughs> my, that's about two months old, uh, old by that saying. Yeah, no, well. Uh, let's not forget that like last last week I revealed that I didn't know what Fortnite was. Yeah, you, you're, you're really old. Yeah, I know. Like, I'm, I'm like almost a year older than you. Mm, yeah, but like if, if you just talk about your, like what you know, and what you, what you listen to, like somebody would think you're probably like forty six. Yeah, true. Yeah. Well, I don't like that damn damn loud rock and roll music <laughs> the kids are playing these days. I also think the Beatles will be the downfall of this country. Uh, did did they say that in the UK? Da- damn Satanists. Or was that a more uh, American probably, thing? I think it was more of an American thing. Do you remember like the the era of playing music backwards to find the satanic messages in it? Oh yeah, like that episode from The like, Simpsons. What's that? Viva what that? Oh, yeah. Join, join the army. Yeah. <laughs> Lieutenant LT's smash. Uh, Otto, where are you going? I don't know. I just had a sudden urge to join the army. No, you're being brainwashed. Probably. <laughs> Ivan et Niaj. <laughs> oh, that's it. Oh, God. Yeah. yeah. That's a good one. Some people, I feel like some people probably don't like it. I don't know who they are, but I imagine some it's people It's the same people that don't like the one where Lisa becomes a vegetarian. Probably. Yeah. Yeah, same people who who don't like the one they're probably yeah, they're probably the same people who just say they hate Lisa yeah because um, they hate women <laughs> okay so yeah that's it we're, we're done with the songs uh, yeah, yeah okay the songs pretty yeah. especially the first one like this is Halloween song it sticks in your head and uh, yeah it'll you can probably recall it yeah. like five years down the line after seeing it yeah and all of the music advances the plot which is more than can be said for some music <laughs> That, yeah, that, I think anyway, this is quite a rarity in that, like, every single song pretty advances much the plot. Yeah, it does. advances the plot and establishes, like, character or things that are going to happen. Well, so, I, well done. I think that's because Tim Burton, I think I read he first ri- uh, wrote this as a poem or a, a story oh. just with it's like, musical elements. Well, that makes sense because uh, The Night Before Christmas is, of course, what The Nightmare Before Christmas is, is based on as a mm-hmm. name. And uh, the night before Christmas is, is a po- is a poem. Mm-hmm. Twas yeah. the night before Christmas, and all through the house, not a creature was stirring, not even a mess. Mm-hmm. So, next up, we've got characters, Michael. Yes, characters. beautiful. So, what have you got? Uh, okay, so we'll start with Bunny, Old Bunny, uh, Jack Skellington. 
Um, I think basically I liked the fact that uh, he didn't have any eyes. Yeah, that that, that was good. Yeah, I thought that looked pretty <laughs> cool. And I liked his I liked his house. I was just thinking to myself, like, imagine just living on a precarious tower, and that's where your room is. Um, and I think that says a lot about him because it shows that he's not very self-centered because, you know, you could have your house at the center, or your, your bedroom, sorry, at the center of your house. And that shows that you believe that your house is about you. But he has his bedroom just sticking off the side in this massive tower. Um, and I think that shows that he's not self-centered. Have, have you been uh, watching, like, instructional videos on property design? Or, or, yeah, uh, exactly. Or, uh, uh, I've, been, I've been watching a lot of Sims 2 Let's Plays. Oh, he's... Under the YouTubers, I don't know why it's Sims, Sims Two. Remember that time when I built our university house on, yes, on Sims Two? Yes, that was 2? so fun. Yeah. See, I never really finished the the plot with that. I never got around to uh, <laughs> to to Dylan marrying Scott's That's daughter. The thing I remember. And and living with his neo Nazi son <laughs> called Cornelius. <laughs> uh, great plot line. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah, basically. Um, I, sometimes I'll go back to that. I will. The, the problem is it's like, it's on Sims 2, and I don't think Sims 2 works on like any computer apart from my really old computer, which is very slow. So I have to be really dedicated. I thought, okay, I'm going to advance it, advance that plot. Um, but yeah, eventually it will be complete. Eventually it will, we'll, I'll see which one of us dies last. Yeah. We'll have a, and that'll be good. Anyway, um, so yeah. Uh, but actual things about, I mean, the thing is like everything about him pretty much relates to the plot. Like obviously he's, he is, bizarrely incompetent yeah um uh do you know who um uh, is used as jack's singing voice by the way um liam neeson uh no it's danny elfman oh danny elfman the uh the old old uh music yeah. man so he actually he, he does music far away. and he actually sings um jack skeleton's lines so there you go wow yeah. he's very, very yeah, that's kind of weird I mean, I bet Steven Spielberg can't sing. Yeah, he probably can't. Hack fraud. Um, we got, uh, yeah. Do you want to say anything else about him? No, no, yeah. that's fine. Uh, I think we've covered him quite a bit, actually, already, just in a plot. Um, yes. Catherine O'Hara. Covered him in praise. Mm. Catherine O'Hara as Sally, a ragdoll, scarecrow-like creature of Bingelstein, and the growing love interest of Jack. Uh, okay. She is an amateur toxicologist that uses various types of poison to liberate herself from the captivity of Finkelstein. Does that make her an amateur to- uh, toxicologist? I'm I don't know. Sure. It's probably like she's probably one of those girls who's like can shoot a camera in focus and says she's a photographer. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And all, it's an always yeah. a girl, isn't it? Yeah. Anyone can put bleach in someone's water. Yes. It doesn't make you an amateur toxicologist. I know. Uh, so yeah, Stacy. What, what do you think of uh, What do you think of Sally? Uh, well, okay. So there's there's a lot to unpack here. Oh, is there? Um, because she has, well, she has a variety of relationships. Um, the first one being with Jack Skellington. So I think we should talk about that since we've already mentioned that we haven't mentioned it yet. Um, so this, this romance between her and Jack Skellington, it's, uh, they don't completely sell me on it, to be honest. No, don't they? Uh, it's kind of just like she's got a crush on him. Um, like that's the thing. Um, and I don't know, like, I, I feel like it's an example of, you know, it's an hour and 16 minute film. There's already enough going on. So it's almost like it's exactly. completely out of nowhere. Yeah. It's only an hour and 16. You... Yeah. So there's already, you know, it's, it's stuffed, St- stuffed to the blame, just like Sally will be. <laughs> Jesus. Um, hold on. Okay. Here's the thing. If you haven't thought about the fact that Jack Skellington cannot have a penis. Why not? Because there are no bones in your penis. Despite the the fact bone? <laughs> <laughs> you know what I just reminded myself of? There's a, there's a video. Of like a, a guy with his his daughter, and she's drawn <laughs> a bone, and like it's you know obviously you know how bones kind of have the little knobbly bits mm-hmm. at the end. She's drawn those, but they're very prominent on one end, such that it looks like a pair of balls, and they're not so prominent on the other end, such that it looks a bit like a bell end. <laughs> and uh, the guy's like, you know, what to his daughter? What what are you calling it? And she's like, a boner, because it's a bone. <laughs> And and obviously the dad is it's rather adorable really. The the dad is is finding it very funny, but not wanting to destroy this this cute little girl's innocence. So the important thing is, Luke, that um you don't actually have any bones in your penis. Um, oh really? Your penis is, is made up of muscle. No, not muscle. Oh that was embarrassing. I almost went from your penis is is is, is like a big sack 
that fills with blood, um, which is really attractive um, to think about. So your penis is a big blood sack, um, and Jack Skellington doesn't have any blood or sacks, um, no. except when he dresses up as Santa. <laughs> well, he could probably, uh, he could, like, his fingers could do the job. Yeah, that's true. Um, and yeah, like, I don't know, I mean, <laughs> I guess, yeah, she's she's fine, though, because she's, you know, just got a, a dead a dead woman's vagina. <laughs> Um, although here's the question: Was she consistently? Maybe she's intersex because maybe she was built up partially from from male organs. I, I don't know, Michael. That's that's a whole other conversation. Maybe maybe Finkelstein's into his his dick girls. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, so that brings us back to the yeah the romance. Basically, there's not there really isn't much to say about it apart from the fact that it is just like she's admiring him from afar. She's like, oh, he's really a, you know I really love Jack Skellington, and he's like Christmas. I like Christmas. Christmas, Christmas, Christmas. And she's like, oh boy, Jack Skellington, he's really attractive. And Jack Skellington's like, do you know what else is attractive? Christmas. I love Christmas. <laughs> Basically, like, like she's just, it, it's like Christmas is his version of video games. You know, he's obsessed with his, his Christmas. And she's like, when are you going to come to bed and stop thinking about Christmas and treat me like a woman? And he's like, you know who the real woman is? Mrs. Claus. <laughs> Oh god, yeah. That's the thing. They get together at the end. It's kind of like tacked on because I don't really know his motivation, Jack Skellington. Yeah. Like, so yeah, basically, it's very, it's very one way. Mm. Like she's into him, and then he's just like, oh yeah, sure, fine, yeah, fine. Uh, next up, we got William Hickey as Doctor Finkelstein. Yeah. Okay. So um, I had a little quote for you Luke, that I actually heard today, um, mm-hmm. completely unrelated to this film. I thought you'd like it. Um, knowledge is knowing that Frankenstein is not the monster. Wisdom is knowing that Frankenstein is the monster. Oh, oh, that's smart. Oh. Yeah. But here's the funny fact. Like, everyone always says, like, um, actually, Frankenstein isn't the name of the monster. Uh, it's Frankenstein's monster. Frankenstein is the name of the scientist. But um, really... Um, because the relationship established in the book is very much a father-son relationship, uh, maybe we could call him Frankenstein. Oh. Because, you know, it's like if someone said, actually, uh, Frankenstein is the name of the dad, not the name of the son. It's like, well, they'd have the same name. So basically, obviously, Finkelstein is based on Frankenstein. That's why I thought I'd bring it up. Um, that is, kind no, of that a, is weird a great thing. well, actually. It's like, actually, Frankenstein isn't the monster. <laughs> you go, well, actually, if you think about it, isn't he? Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of beautiful because, of course, it's kind of funny because I guess, like, obviously this guy's like Frankenstein and he's not a very nice yeah. person. Um, it kind of reminds me of the Joker and Harley Quinn. So I like to think that, you know how, like, when Suicide Squad came out, there were all the people, like, romanticizing the Joker and Har- Harley Quinn. <laughs> I like to think when this film came out, there were loads of people romanticizing um, Sally and, and Dr. Finkelstein. <laughs> oh, you're going to say Sally and Jack Skeleton, but yeah, maybe Sally. Yeah, Sally and Dr. Oh, Finkelstein. Good. It was like, because Dr. Finkelstein, he's got that abusive thing going yeah. for him. He's like a regular Christian Grey. Yeah, if this movie um, came out today, people like Kyle would definitely, definitely be into that. Yeah. Yeah, they'd be into Finkelstein. Yeah. Ooh, you're going to experiment on me, Dr. Finkelstein? Right, let's move on. Ooh. Uh, Anyway, yeah, nothing to say about Finkelstein, except for the fact that it's pretty hilarious that he, like, takes off his skull and scratches his brain. Yeah, that was nice. Yeah. Uh, we got Glenn Shaddix as the mayor of Halloween Town, an enthusiastic yeah. leader who conducts town meetings. His wild mood swings from happy to distraught because his head spins between a happy and sad face. Yes. Uh, where some career politicians are figuratively two-faced, the mayor is literally so. Yeah, but it's like I say, I mean, it's kind of like saying a lot of the things I said, like how his figurative two-face could symbolize a literal two-facedness or sorry the other way around um but like it doesn't because he's just a very nice guy all the way through so basically or everything that needs to be said about him was already said under like the plot that like he's not actually that interesting because he doesn't yeah. have any you know he could have been interesting yeah he could have been he could have been but he wasn't uh, we got and that's all your fault next up we got uh ken page as oogie Boogie. A villainous uh, boogeyman in Halloween Town who has a passion for gambling. Yeah. Um, so, uh, I, do you have anything to say about this guy? Uh, I think um, that he can boogie boogie oogie. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to talk about him because I just read this in the Wikipedia page. Uh, Danny Elfman was worried the characterization of boogie boogie would be considered racist by the National Association for the Advancement of Coloured People, or the NAACP. Elfman's predictions came true. 
Uh, well, and the, there's a load of stuff then after that about oh. uh, the uh, how, how the, the producers in the movie said, "No, nah, it's it's not racist. Come on." So yeah, do you think Iggy Bean uh, was a racist depiction? I, I, I've been done seen about everything, but I ain't never seen a racist depiction of an African American. So more importantly, though, um, was the character racist, Michael? I mean, not, not to me. I mean, not no, I mean, obviously not to me. But like, I don't know. I didn't seem racist. <laughs> um, the thing is, like one time there was a little greetings card that was talking about how good it is that uh, like people are advancing in science. It was like a little kind of congratulations on graduating card. And it was saying, like, oh, yeah, you're going to be an astronaut. So you better watch out, all you black holes out there. Um, mm-hmm. And the National Association for the Advancement of Color People got upset because they thought that it said black hose. And they were like, hey, this says black hose. Um, so basically what I'm saying is that from that point onward, um, kind of, I don't know, like I kind of struggle to fully appreciate exactly what is and is not supposed to be uh, an offensive depiction. But I mean, like, the thing is, what about it the seems very much like he was. Yeah, well, the crows in Dumbo, obviously. Uh, you know what? Are they, you know the live action remake of Dumbo. What are they gonna do? <laughs> because like, the thing is, like the whole Disney live action thing. I wonder if they're gonna do a live action remake of uh, of the Nightmare Before Christmas. Wouldn't that be great? Um, I think they easily could, and no, it would, they be, could it would be fucking terrifying. <laughs> like the only thing that makes this okay is the fact that it's animation. Uh, but anyway, yeah. Um, so, no, well, if they actually did that, I think that would be really cool. Yeah, actually, in my head, like I'm imagining it, and it does seem pretty cool. I'd be down that for it. That is actually one of the things that I think would actually work, and they yeah. should do it. Yeah, do it, Disney. Yeah. Disney, I know you're listening. So do a live action. And also, one of our eight viewers. have the mayor petition. We'll start a petition, and we'll get eight signatures. Um, but yeah, have the mayor be uh, a two-faced villain, and also have a war between Christmas Land and Halloween Land. I demand it. Nah, I, I, I don't know about that. We, you, know when, you know when Tim Burton did uh, like the Alice in <laughs> Tim Burton did the Alice in Wonderland live action remix and mm-hmm. it, he like Lord of the Rings did up. He was like, oh yeah, there's like this massive battle between oh, yes. Alice, the, Alice in Wonderland and the Mad Hatter was like, had PTSD because <laughs> he had a war. And it was just like, oh, oh dear, God. Tim Burton. You know what? I mean, when was the last time Tim Burton made a film that wasn't just like embarrassing? Probably Sweeney Todd. Uh, anyway, just, just not with it. Uh, so where were we? Um, yeah, we were about... just talking about Oogie Boogie. <laughs> oh, yeah, Oogie Boogie, yeah. Like, I don't know, like, to me, I was just thinking about like, nothing. I wouldn't think anything about him was, was that. I mean, apart from anything else, he was literally white. Huh? <laughs> so. Yeah, but he had a, uh, he had a black voice, Michael. Yeah. He was like, hey, that's not what black people sound like at all. <laughs> hey, Italian American. Oh, black person. Yeah. It's because we've been talking about Greece. Yeah. So you've uh, got your Danny Zuko. Yeah. Also, because back. it's slightly less offensive to do a, uh, uh, an Italian person voice. So if I actually did a black person voice, it would be considered offensive. So um, yeah, uh, a good point. So I have uh, to do an Italian person voice. Uh-huh. Yeah, and uh, as we all know, the closest thing to black people is Italians. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, um, actually, I said that. You, uh, hear what happened yesterday with the Napoli player got racially abused uh, in a match. No, did they no. throw meatballs at him? <laughs> no. No, sorry, a black player got racially abused in a football match in Italy. Yeah, I know. So they threw meatballs at him. Oh. Oh, well, I, okay, yeah, I guess actually, now I think about it. So I was imagining in my head that but that wouldn't really work. Like, yeah, I was imagining in my head that racist people would throw things that were stereotypically associated with them at yeah. people. But that doesn't really make <laughs> So, yeah. Um, but, I yeah, mean... Yeah, it's like instead of that, a banana being thrown at a bar, yeah, yeah. it's like... A, ga- a piece of like gammon. Fish and chips. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What does that symbolise? Get out of our country. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, and yeah, it was Inter Milan, and they've had their, uh, they, they've, they've been banned for like, uh, all their fans have been banned for two games from attending Inter Milan home games. So there you go. That's what, that's what's happened. Wow, all of their yeah. fans. All of their fans. That's crazy. Um, mm-hmm. So I think, uh, well, just one question, Michael, because this is we, we're doing this because it's a Christmas movie, but we're also doing it because it's a 25 year old movie. Uh, so we, what we do for a lot of movies that are around this age is, has it aged well, basically, because it's 25 years old. So has this movie aged well? Uh, okay. So, um, story. I'm going to say yes. Story wise, it's fine. Uh, animation wise, it's also very good. Nothing wrong with the animation. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, the only thing I can imagine is like I don't know. Apparently, people think it was kind of racist, which I wouldn't even think of. 
Uh, so maybe that's an issue to some people. As far as I'm concerned, yes, it has. Uh, no, it's it's just a little bit. Yeah, that's true. It was, it's, it's just, just like a crazy a people. Um, yeah. So, yeah, basically, yeah, the answer is yes. Um, and that's kind of like, it's one of those things where because the animation isn't like, like, you know, you, you watch like Toy Story and you're like, oh, I mean, it's good. But, you know, they were clearly trying to have some looking animation and they didn't really hit the mark on that. But, you know, whatever. This, it's fine. Well done. Yeah. Yeah, no, it still holds up. Like, that's the thing with stop motion animation. It, it, you can't really do it better. Can yeah. You? It's just moving stuff around. Yeah, exactly. so, that's yeah, all they're it, doing, Luke. Yeah, that's <laughs> all they're doing. Yeah, so it, it holds up. It's going to hold, it's held up in 25 years. Like, if you, if you turned on TV and it was on, you'd yeah. have a good time watching it just like you would. It's like, it's like asking if Charlie Chaplin holds up. Is it? I don't know. I mean, I guess like, uh, oh, it's like asking if Tom and Jerry holds up. There we go. Tom and, Tom, yeah. well, apart from the, you know, <laughs> apart from that time <laughs> where Tom is trying to keep the house clean and Jerry fills the house up with coal. And then, uh, Tom walks out of the house covered in coal and the, the owner of the house notices Tom, but because he's covered in coal, she thinks he's a black person. So she says, you there, have you seen a no good cat around here? To which Tom covered in coal replies, no, ma'am, I ain't never seen a cat around here. No way, no how. Nah, nah, nah. Um, and then, of course, when he walks out of the coal, thus revealing the bottom of his body, which for some reason isn't covered in coal. It doesn't really make any sense. The top of him is covered in coal, but the bit of him that was actually submerged in coal isn't covered in coal. Uh, but she sees that it's not covered in coal. So she says, hold on a minute. You're not a black person. You're a cat. Um <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell me she actually says that. <laughs> no, she doesn't. No, she just says Thomas. It's kind of funny actually because she is also black. Um, so, oh, right. so apparently, even black people uh, can't distinguish between actual black people and cats covered in coal. Yes, or well, they couldn't in Hollywood. Yeah, which oh, is yeah. kind of weird because there are black cats out there anyway. So I don't know. Like in the mm. Tom and Jerry universe, they're just black people walking around, and whenever they see like a, a black cat, they're like, "Hey, like black person." <laughs> Basically, Tom okay. and Jerry hasn't aged well. That's what I'm saying, Luke. Mm. Yeah, Tom and Jerry, I think, is is memeable. <laughs> classic. Yeah. What, what would you mean, classic? Classic. Classic racism. Uh, yes. Um, so, yeah. The Nightmare Before Christmas, it has aged yes. well. And, yeah, it's no surprise. Then. So, next up. Conclusion. Yes. Um, do you want to go first, Luke? I'll go first. So, interestingly, Michael... I look again looking at the Wikipedia page. This film ranked number one on Rotten Tomatoes top twenty five best Christmas movies. So there wow. you go. It's better, better than even Home Alone. Uh, I look, it's got ninety five percent on Rotten Tomatoes. So it's it's the best rated Christmas movie of all time. Yeah, yeah, I, I actually did see some of the reviews. Um, because I yeah, so and I saw ninety five percent on Rotten Tomatoes. Yeah, I wonder if it's also classed as a Halloween. I mean, I mean, what category would you put it in? What well, Halloween here's the thing. Movies? Okay, Halloween films are like horror. And there's a lot of horror films out there. So I think, to be fair, to be honest, I would say this is a Christmas Eve film. Like, I would think you should watch this film on Christmas. You should watch this film on Christmas Eve. Because that's it's specifically about Christmas Eve. Um, but yeah, I think, like, basically, I mean, maybe this is just my old uh, socialist redistributism kicking in. But uh, I just think, um, like, Halloween is like the 1%. Like, of the holidays, if, if like, money was films uh, and holidays were people, mm-hmm. then... Um, then Halloween is the 1%. It's the wealthy elite because it's got every single horror film ever made. The Exorcist, Day of the Dead, the original 1930s Dracula films, all of them are perfectly acceptable Halloween watching. Um, meanwhile, Christmas is like, um, it's like an old person. Uh, it's got quite a bit of money, but it doesn't really know how to spend it. Um, and it <laughs> can't keep the heating on. Uh, because, like, I mean, there are some Christmas films, but they're mostly crap. So when you break it down, there aren't that many Christmas films that are actually worth anything. And therefore, we, we give it. Like, like Nightmare Before Christmas is like welfare, which we're taking from Chris, uh, from Halloween and we're giving it to Christmas. Yeah. Well, I guess, I guess that's the thing. There's a theme in in a, in horror movies, and it's horror. Um, and obviously, that you can, you can apply that to Halloween. Uh, and what with Christmas movies, what's, what's the theme of Christmas? Jesus. Jesus, yeah, so The Passion of the Christ, that's a Christmas oh, yeah. movie. Well, the thing is, that's yeah. an Easter film. That's the problem. I mean, oh, that's Easter. Yeah, so yeah. Jesus, I mean, he's got too many holidays. 
Yeah. <laughs> so I guess well, what the theme of Christmas is kind of like being good, being nice, giving, yeah. and all that. And so I, so there's quite the, a lot of movies like Care Bears, like that. Care Bears Christmas Adventure. Yeah, and but it doesn't. What I'm trying to say is, if we did the equivalent with horror and Halloween to like nice, you know, nice messaged films in Christmas, then it'd be like any movie with a positive message would yeah. be a Christmas film. Do you get what I'm saying? Yeah, I get what you're saying, Luke. Yeah. So yeah, uh, we we don't do it though for Christmas films. So there you go. Um, and yeah, so I yeah I I would say this movie is more a Christmas film because you're right, it's not scary really. Apart from if you're like five years old, probably. Yeah. And it it, it is about Christmas essentially more than Halloween. So uh, yeah, this movie also it became a cult hit, and uh, I just want to tell you a little story. It's uh, all about how your life got flipped, turned flipped upside, down. upside yeah. down. Okay, I'll, yeah. I'll sit right here. I'll tell you how Laurie and Meek Rudnick, a couple whose degree of obsession with the Nightmare Before Christmas is so great. Yeah, they plucked out their eyeballs and stitched dead bodies onto them. They named their son after the real life person that a character in the film is based on. Um. Wait, okay, so who is the real life person that the character in the film is based on? I think it's uh, Tim Burton. Oh, okay, got you. Sorry, yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. So I, I assume that is the, so there. So there you go. Um, the, people like this movie. I, I said before, I'm Kyle, he'd like this. He, he, he'd probably be all over this movie. He'd be like, eh, have you seen Tim Burton's Nightmare Before Christmas? Like that, in his voice that he has, like, in perfect minute. Uh, yeah, so there you go. It's, it's, it's a classic, and the animation still holds up, and it's, it's fantastic. Uh, like we said, the plot could use a bit more meat. It could have used an antagonist. There really was that conflict missing in this movie that would have taken it up another level. But it's only one hour and 16 minutes long. And so it's a nice, easy watch. And um, definitely around Christmas time. Yeah, I do think it will get you in the mood uh, for Christmas. So I am going to give it, Michael, a 7.5 out of 10. Yes. Um, so this film was a good film. Um, I enjoyed it, and I think it was very competently made. Uh, having said that, uh, it, it's, it kind of feels a lot like a, a, a neat little Christmas short, more like a, so with that in well, mind. that's what it was intended to be. Yes, that makes sense. Way. Okay. So yeah. yeah. So the problem is it kind of, it doesn't have quite the same weight as a lot of, uh, actual feature length films. Um, it's a bit like watching the Gruffalo. Do you remember when they made the little, um, yeah, yeah, and that remember, was, yeah. that was neat. I enjoyed it. But at the end of the day, once you get past the fact that it's a mouse making up a creature called the Gruffalo and then meeting that creature with hilarious consequences ensuing, uh, you think, ah, now all things considered, this was better than The Gruffalo, and it was a good film. Uh, and it was a film that, obviously, I think you should watch once. Um, I don't see the point in, like, making this a, a mainstay. You know, I don't see the point in watching it, like, a lot of the time. Uh, I'd say, for example, if we're talking Christmas films, I, I would rather somebody watch Die Hard every Christmas. Than is watch, that a uh, Christmas film, though? There we go. Um, but, you know, like... Uh, it is, there, by the way. There are a lot of films which uh, you can... Well, there aren't that many films that you can watch on Christmas, but I actually don't think that the scarcity of Christmas films uh, justifies watching this film uh, more than once if you've already seen it as an adult. You know, if you saw it when you were a kid, watch it again, and you'll probably appreciate it and enjoy it. Having said that, if you're like an adult um, and you've already seen it, then I already see any point watching it again. Um, having said all of that, that's all kind of negative, but I do still appreciate the music. I think it was good use of music and like I say it was one of the only musicals I've ever seen where every single music musical number felt relevant uh, the animation was really good um, and the only thing that I really think held it back was just the fact that there's not much conflict to the plot or anything like that um, so I'm going to rate it just above Ocean's 13 uh, and just below Creed uh, and it's above Ocean's 13 and above several other films uh, based on the merit of the animation so there we go Mm -hmm. well, there you go so Michael uh, obviously this will be our last movie that we review this year and I'm hoping you get this out before January the 1st uh, I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll pray on that that, that could <laughs> yeah. be yeah. Uh, maybe um, yeah I think so so what do you think has been the best movie that you've watched this year Um. well for this podcast um, yes. Yeah, I thought so. Okay, yeah. so yeah. we've uh, we've we've been um, 
looking at all sorts of films. Uh, and like I say, I mean, we kind of mentioned it several times, but a lot of the best films we watch are towards the beginning when we're doing the Oscar films. Mm-hmm. Um, all in all, I'm actually quite comfortable still with what I consider to be the best film that we've actually done. And again, it is, it's a surprising one, all things considered. It is uh, La La Land. Um, and that was just because of the, the interesting co- set design, interesting costumes, interesting uh, cinematography, and you know, fun music, and uh, deep, deep emotional, mm. complicated mm-hmm. uh, interpersonal relationship portrayed between Ryan Gosling and, um, you know, the other one. Emma weird Stone. face, Emma Stone. Um, what do you call her? I called her Weird Face. Oh, yeah. She kind I mean, of has a bit of a weird face. Well, I said before, like, he's, she's got those bu- buggy eyes. Yeah, buggy like, eyes, that's it. Yeah, yeah. they're quite big. Um, but yeah, uh, my well, the best film, I think, of 2018 that we've reviewed is actually the first film that we I know, I know yeah I, I know which one it is it's it's get out isn't it get, get out yeah so i only gave two movies uh nines out of tens and they were two out of the first three we reviewed um, yeah which was get out and arrival so they both got nine out of ten um and yeah i i think that get out is uh, obviously a popular person again but i i just remember thinking get out was better and yeah. so yeah i only gave la la land an eight out of ten i think i wrote if I remember correctly, yes. I criticised it for just straying off the path in the middle of the yes. movie um, and being more realistic, which is like, oh, that's not really what it should be about. Um, but yeah, so Get Out, 9 out of 10. That's what I uh, that's what I gave it. And yeah, I think it's the best movie that we reviewed uh, of the year, of 2018. Yes. I actually had a... Oh, I'm, I'm looking less stingy than you now, Luke, because I actually have five 9 out of 10 films. Uh, in my, my nine out of ten threshold, which I've kind of retroactively applied to my little rankings. Mm-hmm. Um, and they are, uh, La La Land, obviously, and then Moonlight, Arrival, uh, Get Out, Get Out towards, um, you know, quite a bit mm-hmm. lower down because, uh, and that was just because, um, I was actually thinking about this the other day, uh, mostly because actually I should mention this. This is important, uh, in a way. So basically, PewDiePie, as we know, uh, is a racist. Um, <laughs> but no, PewDiePie has, has been accused multiple times of, dabbling with the alt-right and yeah uh, just did just toe in that alt-right pool you know yes uh and recently he actually did a shout out to an alt-right youtuber yeah i heard this yeah um and i've actually been thinking for ages about like that guy because he made a video called uh i might have actually mentioned this when we did the get out review but he made a video called get out a review for non-racists and basically the point of the video is he's trying to argue like, oh, you don't have to be a racist to dislike Get Out. Um, it's kind of funny because the video is called A Review for Non-Racists, and yet the only the video is for racists. And that's kind of the funny thing. It's called A Review for Non-Racists, but the video is specifically intended for racists who want an excuse to say they don't like Get Out that doesn't involve just criticizing the fact that it's you know a film about yeah. black people and how racism is bad and things like that. Um, well, maybe uh, that's the thing. Like, from the title immediately, you can tell, oh, yeah, that was, it, it's going to be... a Review for racists, like yes, exactly. Yeah. Guy, it's, I'm definitely not racist, guys. It's like you yes. have to keep saying that. Okay, yeah. But, uh, but yeah, um, and obviously PewDiePie has since. I, I've been thinking so much about it because basically PewDiePie retracted the. Uh, he was like, "Oh no, you know, I've, I've removed him from the thing." The funny thing about PewDiePie, and this is what's always bothered me, he's spoken about this whole like, like first of all, he is he's accused. Like there must be a point where he wakes up and thinks to himself, "Man, I'm accused of spreading," you know far-right propaganda way more than any normal person should be and like like maybe it's something i'm doing but the funny thing is like he's always like um hey guys uh you know or he, he said he said in his apology videos like I've, I've stopped dealing with that kind of you know far-right content because of the the media um stress and things like, well, like the media attacking me and things like that and i was thinking it would be a little more reassuring if he said that he'd stop dealing with far-right content because he actually uh, repudiates the far-right um, yeah, when he realizes that. <laughs> yeah, it's just like, oh yeah, I've decided that, you know, being a Nazi is a bad thing, so um, I'm not going to be shouting out yeah. far right channels. But instead, it's just like, oh yeah, the media. Anyway, I the killed a bunch of Jews and, you know, the media got yeah. on my back and I was like, you know what, I'm going to stop doing that. <laughs> yeah. But um, basically, uh, it did make me think about Get Out. And I kind of doubled back on what I originally said about Get Out, which is that I almost think it would have worked slightly better or like a lot better as a off the wall, uh, full on satire. But again, that's just an example of a. Uh, me having very, you know, my own little preferences. Uh, mm-hmm. So yeah, and um, and the other thing I've got down there uh, is the Grand Budapest Hotel, uh, which I thought was really neat. Um, oh. What did I give the then, Grand Budapest Hotel? I gave it a out of ten. And the question is, Luke, what what are your what are your worst films? So the worst film, um, I've got three 
which I uh, three films which I gave two out of ten to do. Those are Fifty Shades of Grey, Fifty Shades Darker, and Daddy's Home Two. So, mm. out of all of those, which is the worst movie? I mean, here's the thing: Fifty Shades of Grey is probably the, the worst movie, in just like the content, but it's interesting. Fifty Shades Darker is not interesting, but it is so bland and just just boring. Uh, it's you could argue it's worse than Fifty Shades of Grey. I'd pr- probably say it's just it's a little better because of how un- unoffensive it is, uh, or inoffensive I should say. And then there's Daddy's Home Two, which is just awful, absolutely awful, and has no redeeming qualities. Uh, and so it's real it's it's a real struggle to pick between Daddy's Home Two and Fifty Shades of Grey, which is the worst movie. Uh, but I'd probably say it's Daddy's Home Two because. Oh. Like I said, I think the fact that Fifty Shades of Grey is a bit more interesting just takes it takes it above Daddy's Home 2. So I'm going to say Daddy's Home 2 is the worst movie that we reviewed. Uh, yeah, actually, you know what, Luke? I, I am deviating from you somewhat because, uh, number one, I actually do have I have a 1 out of 10 slot. So I kind of messed around a lot with my like bottom ones um, in that I just put like the 1 out of 10 slot like mm-hmm. in there. But... Um, I had, my worst film is one you didn't mention, um, and it's actually one we did very recently. It's I Feel Pretty, uh, just because it was so just... You really uh, hate Amy Schumer. Yeah, exactly, yeah, just because I'm a sexist. I gave that a three out of ten. For oh, yeah. Um, and uh, But weirdly enough, actually, and this is a, a fun fact, so Fifty Shades Darker and Fifty Shades Grey, I actually agree with you. I've got Fifty Shades Darker slightly better, um, mm-hmm. and they're, they're my third and second worst film. Uh, Danny's Home is actually in a, a four... Um, and by my somewhat arbitrary out of 10 specification, I actually had it just edging into the, the two out of 10 slot, which is obviously better than uh, the same as you, mm-hmm. but, uh, it's a whole one above the other two. And the thing about daddy's home too, because it's a Christmas film. And I think in this time of Christmas, we should understand the, the fun <laughs> of family, uh, the yeah, fun it is a Christmas together. film actually. Yeah. Um, and you know, uh, remember that time when I feel like this happened, like this could be completely made up. I feel like at one point, Will Farrell goes to cut down a Christmas tree, but it's actually a phone wire, and then he gets electrocuted and puts out all of the power. I mean, I don't remember that specifically, yeah, but, but it I feel like it me. happened. Yeah. yeah. So basically, and I think, you know, that's the kind of thing that that people need right now. With Donald Trump, with Brexit, with all this stuff, we just need to get together and laugh at a man, um, you know, trying to cut down a phone wire. Yeah. I just want to clarify, because I said that, obviously, Fifty Shades, well, why I think Fifty Shades Darker is better than Fifty Shades Grey. It's because of its in a. I, I don't get pissed off watching it, but it's just so vapid and there's no plot. I don't get I like Fifty Shades of Grey. I've just I've made up my feelings clear on it. But I get pissed off watching Daddy's Home Two, just how bad and frustrating it is. And I think because obviously Fifty Shades of Grey is more interesting. That's why it's last. So Got you. Yeah, I, I'm just pissed off with that movie because it was so bad. Yes. Yeah. Well, you know. You can't please everyone. Luke. No, you they can't. always say that the, the the secret to to failure is trying to please everyone. Mm-hmm. Yes, uh, that's okay. what I say. Well, there you go. Uh, so the so next, yeah, that's 2018. What's the most? Yeah, join us, us next week. No, no, oh, my, most, average. The most, the most average. All right, okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna find my my dead in the center movie. This is gonna be fun. Uh, so we've reviewed. Okay, so this is actually weird. I think I've got one film on here that we didn't actually review, mm-hmm. and that one film is Hello High Water which we were going to review, and then it got moved around. So I've actually reviewed 54 films. Now, Luke, tell me, what is, what is half of 54? 27. 27, which also, by the way, is the most random number. Uh, and this is actually interesting, Luke. This is, this is one of my... So as it happens, the most average film on my list is possibly my most controversial take, uh, a very inaverage tour. Uh, and it's actually A Quiet Place. Um, wow. Which, as, as you'll remember, I just wasn't massively taken with um it's worth noting that it's it's just at the bottom of the six bracket um and to clarify a point for me a six is like a good film but it's a film that just doesn't quite do uh enough to to get into the, the sevens the and the eights uh, and obviously nine is a film that is an artistic masterpiece but yeah obviously i'll admit that's a, a controversial thing i'll say for the record um <laughs> what, what makes it even more controversial is that one space before like below spite uh, uh a Quiet Place in spot 28 is actually Spider-Man 3. Uh, oh, wow. Just cla- to clarify a point here, Luke, wow. Spider-Man 3 is in that spot for a very different reason, which is just that I found it 
really um, entertaining. Um, see, here's the thing. Basically, everything below Spider-Man 3 is basically just films that I found kind of boring. Like there's Sleepless in Seattle, yeah. Mission Impossible, Ant-Man, uh, you know, Ocean's 12, things like that. Uh, so, and then and above it, you've got things like Predator, Ocean's 11, Minority Report, The Fugitive, Ocean's 13, and uh, A Nightmare Before Christmas. So, yeah, there we go. Now, what, what, what's your most average film? So, and how many films How many films do you have on your... Actually, you don't have a list, do you? But no, do you I assume you have every single film on there, though. Yeah, I have. So, we, I've reviewed 49 films, or I've got the score for 49 That's films. That's weird. Oh, you know what it is? I think I did, I did Spider-Man and Spider-Man 2 as well at one point. Yes, you did. And you did the Oceans films as well. Oh, yeah, that's it, yeah. Yeah. Oh, one extra. You did Ocean's 13. Yes. Um, so I think, well, if I, ju- if, if I just go by my average, it'll probably be around 6.5. So I think, judging by all of this, it'll probably be Coming to America. It's probably oh, my yeah. most average I don't know where film. Coming to America is on here, actually. You know what? I have no idea where I put Coming to America. I almost feel like it's not on here, which just sounds crazy, but... You know, it would make sense though because Coming to America was at a point when. Oh, Luke, I actually don't have Coming to America on here. I wow. know. I, 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 the thing is, what probably, what probably happened is I mentioned it and I forgot to add it. So, Jeez. what I'll do at some point is listen back to that episode and uh, take it into account, put it on, on here again. Uh, I've also been thinking, by the way, just as a final thing, I'm going to make a little IMDb play, uh, like list because you can make lists on IMDb. Mm-hmm. Um, it's going to have my, my scores on them in order. I'm going to put them in the description, you know, just so I know nobody cares, but I just think it'll be fun. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, okay, so that's it for not just this podcast, but for 2018 in general. Yeah. Uh, join us next time. Next for, year. Next year. Join us next year for uh, Slumdog Millionaire. And we are going to do that movie because it is the 10th anniversary of Slumdog Millionaire. And yeah, I think it'll be interesting for us to go over that. Uh, and I think it won the Oscar for Best Picture, if I'm correct. Uh, I have to, I have to yeah. That. I think it did. I... I think it did. But yeah. yeah. I think it's an interesting movie, and obviously, for 10 years since it came out, it'll just be interesting to, to have a look at it. So, yeah, that's what we're going to be doing next time Slumdog Millionaire. So, thank you for uh, listening to our last review of the year, uh, The Nightmare Before Christmas. Uh, we've been selecting and flexing on it because of the holidays, and it's been 25 years since it first come out. Uh, who have you been, Michael? Uh, I've been Michael. And I've been Luke. And, yeah, thanks for listening. Join us next week for Slumdog Millionaire. And a whole list of new movies to review. Goodbye. Goodbye.